Uh, hi, thank you everyone for uh, coming to my talk. Uh, yeah, so today I'd like to talk to you about um, modular OGC API uh, workflows uh, and the OGC API specifications that uh, make these possible. Uh, so first, basically, the, the vision is to try to instantly uh, integrate geospatial data and processes um, that are available from anywhere for both visualization and analysis. So that's, that's the goal. And uh, basically, the, the hurdles with geoprocessing workflow is uh, w with batch processing specifically. Uh, so it, it takes a very long time, right, to wait for, for a whole batch processing to complete. So you have to wait before you can do anything else. Um, the other challenge is it's difficult to bring together uh, different data sets and processing capabilities that are uh, served from different places. Um, so that's kind of the main challenges that we're trying to solve with this uh, OGC API um, processes, part three, workflows and chaining. Um, so uh, so the, why the, where the drawbacks that you have a, a long batch processing is uh, by the time the whole workflow is complete, there might be new data that arrive that would be actually better, uh, more useful. That, uh, for example, uh, earth observation that keeps being collected by uh, satellites uh, uh, every day. Uh, so that's one of the challenge. Um, another problem is the long feedback loop. Uh, so, uh, your, um, so data has to be downloaded to the processing uh, uh, server or, or local processing. Um, then you have to run the processing, uh, and then you have to visualize the output uh, and often this is for like a specific area and resolution of interest. And, and then if something is wrong, you want to tweak the settings. For example, if you have some uh, algorithm with parameters, and then you have to run through the whole thing again and restart the whole processing chain. So that might take quite a while. Uh, it's also to, from the server side and the processing capability side, uh, it might be difficult to prioritize maybe more important uh, users or use cases versus uh, other users uh, that is less priority. For example, uh, disaster or emergency response is one scenario. And all of this basically makes for inefficient use of the resources in terms of bandwidth, uh, time, and uh, processing power. And this ends up uh, wasting money as well. Um, in terms of the uh, challenges with the integration of the data, so. First, you have to find the processes and the data um, that first are compatible together, uh, but also that uh, basically helps you answer the questions that you're trying to answer. Um, then, if you, have, if you discover processing capabilities, uh, there might be challenges to, um, to be able to use them in terms of uh, aut authentication requirements, and it might require to first uh, basically define your workflow then deploy it and um, be able to, to be able to run it, to execute it as a process. Often you have to deploy it first, and that usually requires uh, authentication. Uh, that's one other integration challenge. Um, and then in terms of interoperability, so uh, specific formats, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, or specific APIs, like for example, uh, uh, OGC API coverage versus OGC API tiles versus WCS. So th there may be like expectations of a very specific thing that if you don't have exactly that combination that is defined in the workflow, your workflow won't run at all. And there's no, uh, after you've defined the option, you're, you're, there's no other way to, to change this. It has to be like this. So this in general makes the workflows more or less interoperable. And uh, all of this makes it harder to reuse the workflows and reuse the workflows with very similar data sets that like the actual logic, the business logic in the workflow is really the same, but you can't use it because uh, of the way the workflow is defined. And also often it's hard coded for a specific region and area of interest and changing that means changing the whole workflow again. So you can't reuse that workflow directly. So those are the challenges that we're trying to solve. So with the OGC API, uh, it's a family of, uh, of standards. Some are approved, some are still draft specification. And it's trying to be a consistent framework that's better integrated. Uh, so there are processing capabilities and there are, there are uh, data access mechanisms. 
and or, or the, what workflows and chaining, the part three of processes is trying to do, is to better connect the data access with the processing capabilities. Um, so the current status of OGC API, so the consistent framework is provided by OGC API common uh, part one core and part two geospatial data. Uh, that's currently not published, but it's the foundation for several of the other OGC APIs. Uh, then we have uh, processing capabilities. Uh, so OGC API processes part one core is a uh, proven published standard. Um, and then there is part two, which is uh, deploy, replace, and update, which is still a draft specification. This will allow you to upload an application package to create a new process. And then, uh, so processes part three, workflows and chaining, is the main focus of my talk about connecting processes with the data access mechanisms. So by the data access mechanisms, it's most of the other OGC API, like OGC API features, part one core is an approved standard, part two CRS by reference lets you uh, request features in different CRS, and part three filtering will let you filter the features, uh, for example, using the common query language. Um, so features is a way to access the data as vector features. Um, OGC API tiles part one core is in the final stages of approval and publication. And uh, what it will allow is it's an access mechanism that you can request the data, but not only map and, and uh, uh, not only map tiles, but also the raw data. So the tiles and vector, vector tiles and coverage tiles, so you can access the, the raw data. Um, OGC API coverages is uh, another way to request data um, using, uh, for example, a subsetting mechanism, so you can get only the part that you're interested in. Um, and then OGC API environmental data retrieval, or EDR, is, uh, allows, is also a published and approved standard, allows you to request the data with different query mechanism. For example, you can specify a trajectory and retrieve uh, all the data along the trajectory. And then OGC API maps allows you to uh, request either imagery or a rendered map from the server, whether it's rendered on the fly or pre-rendered or just imagery. And then OGC API, uh, the discrete global grid systems, the GGS, is a way to use a different uh, discrete global grid system, which is, this is a little bit like tiles, uh, but also has uh, a way to uh, not only ask, give me the data for these tiles, uh, but also where, are, where is the data that I'm interested in, where is the result? So you specify a query and you get back a, a list of zones, uh, as you call them. And it's not limited to, to square tiles like tiles, but you could have uh, hexagons, for example, uh, for your grid. Um, so I'll quickly go over some of these. So um, OGC API processes part one core, basically um, you have a slash processes slash process ID and then slash execution is your execution endpoint. You post an execution request, and, and then if you're in the synchronous execution mode, you will get back right away the, the result uh, with an HTTP 200 response. But in the execution request, uh, you specify the values for the input, you specify, um, but often this is for a specific fix area and resolution of interest. So you see you have a bounding box in there, uh, and uh, you even have like uh, fixed formats in there, for example. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's quite rigid. So it, it's for this bounding box only. So that's one of the challenges that I was pointing to earlier. Uh, then there's also an asynchronous execution mode uh, where if you specify a uh, respond async prefer header, and then instead of getting back the data right away, you'll get back a 201 that tells you um, that the uh, the job has started basically, and you have a way to pull the, the status of the job, and with its complete results will become available. But it's, it's still the same thing in terms of being a fixed area and resolution of interest, and um, so it's, it still has that, that limitation. Um, then with processes part two, I uh, quickly mentioned earlier, so you have an application package that contains everything uh, that the server needs to create the process. Uh, there's various ways to do this. It could be, for example, a JupyterLab notebook. Uh, it could be a Docker container. It could be a CWL workflow. Or it could be um, 
the execution request that I'll talk about in terms of part three to define your workflow. And after you've done this, your process is available, and then you can execute it with the part one. And there's a way to update it with a put and to delete it with the delete operation. So that's part two. That's still a draft specification. Um, so the main thing I want to talk about is what part three allows you to do. So with part three, uh, the first thing it has is a concept of ad hoc workflow. So you discover processes and data sources that are available here on the client, and right away you can execute it without having to deploy anything first. So that's, that's the main thing that this part three does. So how it does that is in the execution request, you have a new process input type, uh, and basically that process input type can be an input to another process. So you can chain your processes this way, and the process could either be a local process or it could be a process on another server. So this is the way the, the connection uh, works. And the execution is exactly the same as the regular uh, part one sync and async. Uh, but there are also other execution mechanisms uh, that I will talk about that are the other things in part three. Um, so the other thing that we have is the collection input. So instead of in the input pointing to a URL, for example, to a, a GeoTIFF with a uh, very fixed uh, area and format and everything, instead of pointing to a, a file, you point to an OGC API resource called a collection, which is more like an abstract uh, representation of geospatial data. But at that point, you haven't yet said what area, what resolution, what format, or even what API you want to use. You leave that open from the workflow perspective. You just say, I want to use that data that is available uh, as the OGC API from here. So your input, instead of being a, a, an HTTP URL to a file, it's, it's an HTTP URL to a collection, which uh, leaves open all of that. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's the main thing here. And uh, so that's for the input. And uh, so the input to your process can be an OGC API collection. And the other thing that Portree does is the output of your process can also be a collection. So by doing this, um, it's a new execution mode. So instead of being sync and async, you could ask for a collection as an output. So when you submit your workflow for execution, you say response equal collection. And what you get back is exactly the same as you get back when you um, access an OGC API features or coverage or tiles. It's a collection description document that has links to one or more access mechanisms. So if the response is accessible as tiles, you will get a link to tile sets. If your response is available as a coverage, you will get a link to the coverage. If your response is available as features, you'll get a link to item. So it's exactly the same. And the, the nice thing about that is that collection is readily usable in any client that understands those APIs. So for example, it, you can just load it in GDAL by pointing to that document that's the response. So that's, that's the nice thing about that is basically a visualization client doesn't need to have processing code to execute processes. That's one advantage. The other advantage is that you can um, with the uh, other things with the ad hoc uh, workflow execution, you, uh, you don't need to first deploy your process to be able to execute it. And because the output and the input of these OGC API processes are collections, you can chain these processing endpoints together and you can use all of them like it's just one big OGC API that has all these processing and all these data capabilities. Um, and also, uh, so the, the other thing about this, uh, this uh, collection output is how do you actually get the data? Well, that's, you get the data by doing a OGC API features or coverage or tiles requests, and that's actually when the processing happens. So the processing doesn't have to happen when you submit your execution request. All the server has to say is, yes, I'll be able to run this, to execute the process this way, but it doesn't yet do the actual processing. It's just getting ready to do it. So it can validate the whole chain of processes all the way up, uh, but the actual processing asks when the client asks for the data. So uh, as the client zoom in, for example, it can request a smaller area at higher resolution. As you pan, it can uh, do the requests for the different area to the side. So that's the main idea with this. So uh, quickly, um, the, what OGC API uh, tiles allows you to do 
is basically, um, like I mentioned earlier, access data not only as maps, but also as raw tiles, whether it's vector or coverage. Um, the main conformance class uh, that we have, core allows you to request a tile with a matrix row column. A tile set describes the set of tiles with a uh, standard metadata. That's also defined in the 2D tile metric set and tile set metadata standard. And uh, the tile sets list is just your API will list a uh, list of tile sets. And the geodata and data set tile sets are tile sets lists that are connected with the OGC API common uh, specification. Then we have conformance classes for different formats like PNG, JPEG, NetCDF, GeoJSON, Mapbox vector tiles, but those formats are, are uh, not, they're not, uh, you could add additional formats on top of that in your implementation. Um, coverages, uh, one, it uh, gives you a more detailed description of the domain and fields of your data, and it supports conformance classes like subsetting to get only a specific area, and uh, also the range subsetting to only get, for example, uh, a particular band or a few bands that you're interested in. And it also supports downsampling, so you can say, I want this data at this uh, downsampled resolution. It also works with coverage tiles, by, with the tile specification. And the same thing, just like uh, tiles, there's different formats, conformance classes for GeoTIFF coverage JSON, NetCDF, CIS JSON, LAS, and ZAR, but it's not an exhaustive list. More can always be added. Uh, so this is a demonstration that we did with the workflow with Sentinel-2 imagery from uh, ESA through the Eurodata Cube for different season. And then we trained the random forest model with a Parcells database that we know these are the crops here. And then basically we created this ad hoc workflow that points to a, a random forest classification process, point to a collection from the data cube, submit this post request, you get back the collection uh, description, and you see there it's available as coverage and tiles. Then we do a tile request, and that's actually what triggers the prediction uh, for, that executes the, the whole chain. And this is another scenario with the workflow that runs our MAU adapter, which basically connects with OGC API processes part one. If the, if the process doesn't support part three, this is kind of an adapter to make it work with that. So the first process is the adapter. The second process was a routing process from 52 nodes Java PS. And then we loaded the result in, in QGIS with GDAL. So GDAL basically was submitting the uh, process execution, and then you see the routes. Uh, on top of uh, OpenStreetMap. And it's all done with tile requests. So the tile requests ask, and you get the vector tiles for, for the routes. And uh, so these are some of the implementations of part three. So our Gnosis Map Server and PyGeo API in the, in the EOX branch, and there's a link in the presentation um, that supports this. And in terms of clients, our Gnosis Cartographer and, client, and uh, SDK. And also the Web World Win and Testbed 17 uh, GeoData Cube supported this as well. And in GDAL and QGIS, uh, the OGC API driver for GDAL uh, supports part three already, even though it's a, it's a draft at this point. And so in uh, summary, uh, workflows allows you to easily connect data processes from anywhere in a reusable and interoperable manner. And these are the advantages here that I don't really have to go through. Uh, but yeah, to trigger on-demand processing with OGC API data access requests, you minimize the data exchange by requesting a subset and downsample data. And uh, with workflows and chaining, basically, uh, also, yeah, so that's the tree thing, right? So easily connect, trigger on-demand, and um, minimize the data exchange. And so the, the last thing I probably won't have to talk much about is uh, that you can bring algorithms to the data also with simple CQL2 expressions. Uh, on top of yeah, having workflows that you can do ad hoc and deploy, this is like a third way to do processing is you just give a SQL2 expression that define how you derive properties. For example, uh, uh, properties equal NDVI, then you put your NDVI expression right there and um, so that properties filter, sort by, and join collections to do uh, spatial joins. For example, only give me uh, the buildings in this uh, low elevation area for like, flood scenarios. And thank you very much. So there's more information on OGC API processes GitHub. Uh, there's a video here 
if you want to check it out. It's a pretty long video from the project that we did for this. And there's also a draft discussion paper, which I'm hoping uh, will help OGC publish uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.